There's been a lot of a lot of talk about bipartisanship after the election. We need bipartisanship. I think and I believe that we've had way too much bipartisanship for about 60 years. <laughs> Government should never be able to do anything you can't do. If you can't steal from your neighbor, you can't send the government to your neighbor to steal for you. There should be no redistribution of wealth. And I do know that you can have a lot of fun defending liberty. And believe me, if you understand liberty and realize it's the only humanitarian system that existed ever on mankind, I tell you what, if you learn about it, study it, promote free market economics and fight for this, I can guarantee you, you will sleep better at night, you will enjoy your life, and you will feel like you're doing something worthwhile. Defend liberty! Ladies and gentlemen, that was Congressman Ron Paul at the uh, CPAC uh, convention where he won the straw poll. Congratulations, uh, Congressman Paul. Thank you. How's that feel um, when you go to CPAC and you win and then they tell you you're unelectable? <laughs> I guess they had that the sort of lined up because I think some of that started about a week before the CPAC poll was taken because they uh, sort of knew what was going to happen. So they had to discredit, uh, you know, the whole poll because they don't want to admit that there's a lot of young people, especially, that are very interested in what we're trying to do. So, uh, but you know, if, if we're on the right track, and if it is the truth, it'll win out. Uh, but in the meantime, they'll have to uh, be annoyed and I guess try to discredit us. Well, who are they? Well, I think it's anybody who's in the establishment. Most most of the time, the people who uh, lead both political parties are one and the same, and uh, you know they both have the same foreign policy. They both pursue war. They both both believe in redistribution of wealth. They both believe in the Federal Reserve System. They both believe in the Patriot Act. And uh, so the party system and the hiring, that doesn't mean every single person. I work with some very good Democrats who are progressives, and they believe in civil liberties, and they're against the war. In the same way with Republicans, and they're not in into subsidizing the military industrial complex but the, the the problem is is there's so few of us uh, most people are very very uh, much involved in a power struggle the the fight between the republicans and democrats is real but it's mostly over power not over a significant change although obama ran you know an issue of change you know did the foreign policy change uh, did uh, did the monetary policy change the attitude toward the fed change did deficits really change well, the world no, is- it all stays the same. Well, the world is obviously changing, but well, you know, I, I, I wonder why you stay a Republican when they want to paint you as unelectable for higher office every chance they get. Well, do you think they wouldn't do that if I weren't a Republican? <laughs> you know, I think they'd do that no matter. But they, they don't want to hear this story. And, you know, you have you, – I often kid, but we're rather seriously, that there's only two problems in Washington, and that's the conservatives and the liberals. So if they're, if they're really working together, an independent-minded person who happens to have a consistent philosophy, they're both going to resent it because their power depends on it. I well, mean, why is that? I mean, what corrupts the process? You know, what, what I think it's I mean, let, let me put it this I do, too. But, you know, here, here you had this Tea Party that you get a lot of credit for uh, creating. And now it's been taken over by, you know, corporate interests. It's, uh, you know, Dick mm-hmm. Army and the Americans for Prosperity and the Koch brothers and the Cato Institute and Heritage. I mean, how did that make you feel? I mean, you had a grassroots movement that really was into it. And they got out on the street and they started to, you know, peel off yeah. from the Republican policies of, uh, you know, massive war and, uh, you know, on unarmed nations and the whole thing, things that you and I would agree with. And then it, 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 the whole thing gets taken over oh, by corporations. I think it's probably part of human nature. Probably that's the way it, it, it does work. There's always somebody angling to, you know, to have the control. Uh, but, you know, I, uh, I I know it's aggravating, and people wonder why I'm not more frustrated and, and annoyed than I usually appear. But um, <laughs> but I feel, I, I you know, the people I talk to, I still get encouragement from them. You know, I'll, I'll be going to some campus here in the next few weeks, and the campuses – not that all of them feel this way, but a large number will come out, and they'll be like the Tea Party people. How can I not be encouraged? I'm, I'm sorry, not the Tea Party, the CPAC people who came for me. 
you know, those 1,100 or so, these are young kids, and they're, they're not kooky, and they're not, you know, oddballs like people would like to paint them. But they're, they're very, very sincere kids willing to study and read economics and understand why national security doesn't depend on perpetual war and why we don't need the Patriot Act to uh, keep us safe. And so that does encourage me. But your argument or your point that you're making I think is very real too because there are some who never did care as much about those issues and there's others who will come in and co-opt them. And all of a sudden you have a – a Tea Party magazine. <laughs> you know, right. If I if I had anything to do with the Tea Party, you would think, well, maybe maybe they ought to ask me whether we should we should have a Tea Party magazine. Who writes the Tea Party? Uh, you know, uh, who who has been instructed to speak for the Tea Party? <laughs> well, you know, it's obviously uh, you know the money. The money gets to speak for the Tea Party. They co-opted yeah. it. They stole it right out from underneath you. And you know, when I first saw the Tea Party forming, I mean, I was off the air sitting out a lovely non-compete in the free market. You know, they can do that and uh so i was watching it and i was thinking yeah fine this is great they're finally getting it and they're peeling off from this uh, you know uh let's go to war thing with an unarmed nation and they're peeling off from the offense uh, the assault on the fourth amendment the patriot act they're peeling off from uh, you know lowering taxes in a time of war on top of it they're peeling off from the injustice of a uh, system that is so non-transparent that you know nobody knows what the hell happened all we know is there was a big huge ripoff and we were asked to pay for it on the way down now the pension funds are empty and we're being asked to pay for it on the way up. Uh, no, no. You know, I mean, it's just, it's, it's insane. And uh, at first I thought, oh, this is great. People are getting it. People are getting it. This is what I've spit out a spleen to get them to understand. And then all of a sudden it becomes organized and it becomes funded by, you know, the Cato, which is the Koch brothers, Americans for Prosperity, which is the Koch brothers. You know, what, well, you know, it's just, it's so depressing. But I did want to understand something mm-hmm. about your economic principles. Okay. And, what is Austrian economics? Well, Austrian economics, uh, the name comes from the fact that the individuals who really promoted it came from Austria. Mm-hmm. The other day I was giving a talk over the Internet to a group of people in Austria, and I thought it was ironic. I said, well, are there finally some economists in Austria that knows about Austrian economics? No, Mises was Austrian. And and he was really the leader in the 20th century, but he, he was Jewish, and he escaped, you know, uh, from from the Nazis and, and got out and wrote his greatest book when he was 60 called Human Action. And then there was Hayek, who won the Nobel Prize. But they're free market people. They're hard money. They really resent the fact that there's a monopoly cartel that prints money, serves the interests of big banks and big business. And it, it, a lot of times, you know, the cha- I talk about the Chamber of Commerce free enterprise system. Well, the Chamber of Commerce is usually for their interest in the military-industrial complex. Austrian economics is laissez-faire. It says get the government out. But people say, well, wouldn't that be total chaos? And it, it's the way you regulate. And the Austrians believe the regulations come from certain basic rules, like you can't steal, you can't defraud, you fulfill your contracts, you can't print money. And if you go bankrupt, you don't put the burden on innocent people. You go bankrupt and you lose your investment. But that's exactly the opposite of what happened with our crisis. The people who made the mo- money when the bubble was being formed, then they got caught. Then we bailed them out, like you indicated. They bailed them out, and, and the little people lost their jobs and lost their homes. Free, uh, the Austrians predicted this was coming. They knew the bubble was there, and uh, they, they do not get asked one thing in Washington. Nobody comes to an Austrian economist and say, where did we go wrong and what should we do? They're totally ignored out in Washington, outside of Washington, on the campuses. People are studying it. Well, where, where has it ever been tried? Well, there's been bits and pieces tried for a long time. I mean, you know, in America, probably in the latter part of the 19th century was a pretty good example. You had, you had uh, 3% uh, growth systematically for, uh, you know, 30, 40 years. Where it has, uh, the trouble is, is nothing is ever pure. Communism was never pure. Uh, free markets have never been pure. But America had a pretty good example. But in the 20th century, there hasn't been too much of, uh, uh, of a uh, practice of, uh, of free markets. It's always been uh, corporatism. The corporations took over. Instead of the government there protecting well, markets, the, when you say the, the government. When you say the early 20th century, I'm trying to understand what it is, because every time I look it up, uh, I find out that it doesn't get published in mainstream journals because they don't 
the Austrians don't use math or or or, or any right. any metrics. They're called unscientific economists, and <laughs> they say that they act. I mean, I read Hayek, and he, his stated belief was that uh, social science theories can never be verified or falsified by reference to facts. So well, I, I mean, it, it makes it impossible that. for me to understand it. So, but but the fact is, is you can't predict human action. The fact is that if you inject a million dollars into the economy, there is nothing in the world that can tell you what's going to happen. If you give a tax cut, the people might save it, they might spend it, they might do something else. That's why Mises' great book was called Human Action. There is a human element which is unpredictable mathematically. There are certain rules and trends. We do know that if you print a lot of money, the value of that money goes down, but we also don't know when that will happen. We don't know when events occur. We don't know which prices will go up, but we do know that there will be excessive debt, excessive investment, malinvestment. There will be a – you can predict the bubbles, and you can predict that there will be a correction, but we don't know the day and the cause. Like right now, we have a horrendous bubble out there called the dollar bubble and the bond bubble, and it's going to collapse. All Austrians believe that, but we don't know whether that's going to be next week or next year. With the crisis going on in the Middle East, it could come pretty close. Oil going up, uh, you know, uh, nearly 10 percent in a couple days, and these events. Uh, yeah, but they, see, they, they isn't might... that isn't that basic supply and demand? I mean, isn't that human well, action being predictable? So. No, no, but the whole thing is no. There's a psychological element to it. They, uh, they, they talk about uh, the subjective theory of value. The value is placed on a thing not because of how much work you put into it, but because of the demand. So that's the supply and demand. Right. Now the important thing that the Austrians contributed to this, in addition to supply and demand, has been around for a long time. Right. Adam Smith knew this. And that's Everybody right. else knew that, but nobody integrated it with the idea that there's a supply and demand of money. So there's a psychological perception of what the money value will be in the future. The dollar's worthless, but subjectively, we trust the dollar. You and I use it, and, and the world still takes it. But objectively, it has no value. So it will be the subjective well, it's loss value. of confidence it, isn't its that value. will undermine it. Isn't its, mm-hmm. Well, Austrian economics, so it's never been tried, basically, is, is where we're what, at. What, total that. free markets? Yeah, there's never been. I mean, there are no, no such things as free no, markets. Never, never, never perfectly because. Uh, but if you, you know, I mean, you know, if if there were such a thing as free markets, right, we wouldn't have trade barriers. We wouldn't have rules against dumping from other countries. I mean, there there is no such thing as a free market. It, it just it's never. Well, there there is, but there's no such thing as perfect socialism either because you always well, have the I, that's a, that's economy. another you extreme. Have the underground but, economy. but if you look. But there's a lot you can learn on almost uh, free markets if you, and almost sound money. We went on and off the gold standard from the beginning, mm-hmm. but we always went back to it. From the beginning of our history, they said no more printing press money. Up until 1913, if you looked at the price level, you know, bread and clothes and everything else were basically the same. They'd have, like, during the Civil War, they went off the gold standard. Prices went way up, but they went back on the gold standard. Mm-hmm. And you had prices relatively stable. So you have a lot of information that you can gain from this, which should urge us on to even be better at the well, free Well, let me market. make the counter argument. I mean, a fixed money supply dependent on gold, right? No, no, that's not it. How, you, don't how, want to, you don't want to fix anything. You want the well, market if, to determine if, if it. If the dollar, wait, I'm, I'm try, I really want to understand. If the dollar is attached to gold, yes, that's what you're, you're for. Well, yeah, I'm for the, what the market picks, and that's that's what it's picked. The market has picked it for 6,000 years, so okay. I, suspect, All right. I would suspect that they would. It isn't fixing it so much as using it. Instead of saying the dollar is the measuring rod, it's one ounce of gold that is the measuring rod. Mm-hmm. And, and it will fluctuate because, you know, if the right. gold supply shrinks, the right, right. prices supply and will demand. go up and right. whatnot. <laughs> supply and demand again. But uh, I'm saying if, if, if we decided unilaterally, the United States decided unilaterally that it wants to go back to the gold standard, what if the rest of the world didn't and we owed, you know, $3.2 trillion in debt, but there's only $223 billion right now in Fort Knox? How does that work it would be it would be difficult and the british ran into that in 1923 they they had gone off the gold standard uh 
it, it, during the uh, First World War, and they went back on, and they said, it's sort of like your question is a, is a hint of us saying, okay, the last time we were on the gold standard was $35 an ounce. So if we now say, well, we're going back on the gold standard at $35 an ounce, you say, well, that would be crazy. I mean, the gold would be gone in one hour, you know. Right, but I, I, I use Everybody knows the dollar isn't worth it. But what if we went back on the gold standard and it was $3,500 an ounce? All of a sudden, there would be a lot more gold available, you know, to use it. And uh, the, the amount of gold is, is uh, inconsequential if you have free markets uh, in pricing. And also, there's a average growth of the gold supply but, in but the there... world throughout history has been about 2%, and that would sustain economic growth. Well, I mean, I used $915 an ounce, and there's $223 billion in Fort Knox. And at current rates, you know, to pay off our debt, we, we just don't have enough. I mean, it, well, it, we wouldn't. No, that, that, you're right. The transition would be horrendous, right. and that's why I don't advocate that. Oh, my, I, my position is that you just legalize competition with the cartels. The bankers make all the money because they, they have control of the printing press through the Fed. The bankers make the money. They do fractional reserve banking. And then the money is spent by Congress, and they spend it in the military-industrial complex. And then they say, well, we have to give something to the poor. We're going to build houses. But who made the money on housing? The mortgage companies and the builders and the poor people didn't get their houses. So uh, th- that, that is the, uh, a system that would be preventable if you didn't allow governments to, you know, to print money. Now, well, listen, Congressman Paul, I'm really, I'm out of time. I, I, I could talk to you all day. I, I mean, <laughs> there's so much that we agree on. So could I just ask one little tiny favor? Please, okay. next time you get an award or somebody, you know, don't say there's no such thing as bipartisanship because there's so much about you too, like there's so much about you, you that I'd like to talk through. Well, so, well, and and we're not it, of the same party, so... You know, my, my argument... Well, yes, and I was doing that. My point was there was too much bipartisanship because they agree on all these things. Well, no, I, but I, 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 gotta, I, believe in, I believe in coalitions. <laughs> I work with progressive Dennis. I know you do. As much as Republicans. I know you do. So thank you so much. We'll talk okay. again. I appreciate Good it. Thing. Thanks for Bye. the education. Bye. That was fascinating. <laughs> so just so you know, He's pissed off that the corporations have taken over his Tea Party movement, which I suspected. Uh, That was Ron Paul we were talking to. Um, We cannot go on the gold standard. We just hashed that out. If we went on the gold standard unilaterally, we would not be able to pay off any of the debt that we owe to foreign investors. Uh, China, Japan, other countries, they own about $3.2 trillion in U.S. Treasury debt. There's only about $250 billion worth of gold in in, uh, Fort Knox. So we can't do that. Um, Austrian economics has never been put into practice anywhere, not even Austria. And uh, there is no other country in the there is no country in the world that has a free market economy. I just wanted you to hear that directly from Ron Paul. Now, there is a lot that I can agree with him on the the assault on the Fourth Amendment of the Constitution via the Patriot Act. I mean, I'm, I'm there. The fact that he was against invading Iraq. I was there, too, obviously. Uh, there's a lot that we agree on. There's plenty that we agree on. However, his economic uh, plan, I, I think what this proves is just exactly what I said. He's the grateful dad of politicians. I'm glad there's somebody out there doing what he does, but his fans can drive you a little bit nutty. Do you know what I'm saying?